Can you, um, Peter, just before you go on, uh, contained within scales, do you mean like Fenaroli asks his student to learn the rule of the octave? Did the school of Durante create that sort of uh, idea of the, the rule of the octave where you're just, you need to practice the set formula at least at the beginning? Yeah, I, if, you, if you look at the terminology that the Neapolitans use, they talk about scales. Hmm. And, uh, and actually also the, the, the Bologna tradition, they, they talk about scales and not the rule of the octave. The rule of the octave is a, a rather late term, term that appears somewhere in 1820s or something like that for mm. the first time. Really? 1820? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's quite late. It's after the period that I have studied, at least. Okay. Um, but uh, um, what you can see also with scales is that there are, there's not one way to do it because... The rule of the octave gives gives us the impression that it's fixed, right? right it's right. Um, but I think if you look at the counterpoint notebooks, you see that there are it's the same there. They, there are many variations of of patterns over a scale. And by a and scale, so we're talking about not just a because when people, when people hear scales, piano students hear scales. We think of the up and down, the, the seven note scales. But here, are you? What, what, can you be clear what you mean by scale? Yeah, in in the um, here, the scale is often in the bass, right? Okay. So during the tradition, will always put the bass, the, the scale in the bass, and they would learn to make uh, variations over the scale. So one melody or maybe two melodies, and then. Um, uh, some suspensions and, and this figure and, and, and this combination and then uh, um, the, what we call the rule of the octave would be the, the block chord positions mm. in, so the, the later you come the more fixed it becomes I see and the more the level went down of the student <laughs> it's actually very important to, to know also that when this was at, at its peak, um, when it really was really, really good, it wasn't very fixed. Mm. It becomes fixed when the students are lost. <laughs> because they, 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 they tell them, use these fingers and uh, right. if you push this button, it will be correct, right? right and right. that would be the case if you have a really good students in the... 1730s, 40s, where the level was really high, they wouldn't do that. Right. And that's a, at least my my, uh, my my opinion. So a Cimarosa, a Paisiello, when they were students, they would learn many variations of ascending and descending scales in the bass. They would never. They well, they would not have the sort of fixed uh, system that we that uh, a lot of people are familiar with, at least. Yeah. I think it's also a little bit the question of uh, of which school we are talking about. The old-fashioned school didn't want to fix things. The more modern school, they had a tendency to 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 fix things. Okay. So you see these uh, these standard patterns more often in the Durante tradition than in the Leo tradition. Okay. Also in Bologna, uh, still in the eighteen in the early nineteenth century. You have many variations of scales with all kinds of figures uh, in, in, in Mattai, for example. Yeah? He, he even has additional scales <laughs> uh, apart from the eight scales that he shows on in his printed volume. There are even more. <laughs> so it's right. all, also lots of variations of, of uh, 